Okay, we get the opportunity to discuss one of the larger physiological concepts we get the opportunity to cover. Um, this is one of those where if you can spend enough time with it, you end up doing very, very well. Um, the little lights click on, all of a sudden it all makes sense. But if you don't spend enough time with it, then it just becomes this overwhelming, horrible um, concept that you just never quite wrap your brain around. Um, one of the things I do want to make note of is we I think we do a pretty good job of kind of minimizing the pain that this could be. If you go go ahead and take um, some bio, uh, biochemistry classes, um, especially like an upper division biochemistry class, um, the process we're going to be discussing, which is our glucose metabolism, our cellular respiration reaction, yeah, you can get about as deep as you want to get into this from drawing each of the structures and listing each of the enzymes involved in each step, but we're going to try and keep it as simplistic as possible. So to kind of begin that um, and make it as simplistic as possible, I want to present to you a, an equation, a chemical equation, to show, all right, in this cellular respiration reaction, in, in our metabolism of glucose, and we're going to involve, later on, we're going to involve, well, how do we incorporate amino acids or proteins into this process if we need to use them for energy? How do we incorporate fats into this process if we need to use them for energy? But our basic metabolic pathway for the production of, of energy, specifically our energy-containing molecules, ATP, is contained or listed and described in this chemical equation where we're taking C6H12O6, yes, that's glucose, and in the presence of oxygen, we are going to be able to produce 36 to 38 ATP. And we're going to talk about why that's a range. It's not that difficult of a concept, but we do want to make note of, well, why sometimes is it 36 and why sometimes is it 38? And then the waste products of that process will be a little bit of water. And because this is our metabolism, we call it metabolic water. Um, and then also that stuff that we have to breathe out, that CO2, um, where does it come from in the process? So we're going to take glucose and in the presence of oxygen, we're going to produce CO2, a little bit of metabolic water, and a whole lot, 36 to 38 ATP, which provides the energy that we can transfer from this molecule that we've introduced a little bit, and we can transfer it to other processes that we need. We can convert it from one form of energy to another. And that becomes important to understand as well, to understand that we have a law of thermodynamics that says energy cannot be created nor destroyed nor lost, that we just convert it to a different form, that we can take sound energy and make light, and we can take light energy and convert it to mechanical energy, and we can take mechanical energy and make it chemical energy. Kind of, you see that process. We're just continually moving energy from one location to another, and we do that in our bodies all the time. We take electrical energy and convert it to a mechanical energy when we have a nerve talk to a muscle and tell it to contract. And so we're constantly doing that process. So basically what we want is we want to, through the oxidation of glucose, we want to be able to produce ATP, those energy-containing molecules. And it involves four sets of reactions. First step being glycolysis, second step formation of um, a coenzyme, coenzyme A, and we're going to attach one of the products of glycolysis to that. We're then going to um, allow our coenzyme A, which is actually a derivative of a vitamin, we're going to allow it to drop a two-carbon group into Krebs cycle. Now, I'll indicate this as we get there, but sometimes we call it Krebs cycle, sometimes it's called the citric acid cycle, sometimes it's called the tricarboxylic acid or TCA cycle. These are all synonyms. Dr. Krebs being the one that initially described this, has become famous as describing this. Citric acid because in the cycle it's the first molecule we form and because of its structure it's called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. So they're all the same, they're describing the process just in a slightly different way. And then we're going to talk about the electron transport system or the electron transport chain. So I think the best way to approach this is kind of looking at this as a big, kind of a big play production and each of the four steps being kind of a mini piece of that, like a subset of that that, okay, what's going on in this part of the play, and what's going on in this part of the play. And the reason I use that analogy is we want to look first, before we go through this whole process, and describe, okay, who are the players? So if you go to a play and you get a program, 
And on the program, it lists the main characters, and it lists kind of the supporting cast, and it lists, okay, who's who and who's doing what. and gives you all that information, because then if you're someone like me, you can actually follow along and, and instead of trying to figure it out as it goes along. So by looking at those role players, we can get an idea of who's playing the biggest role and what their job is in this process. So that's what we want to do first, and then we'll go into more detail. So the first role player, it's our main role player, because notice it was in the chemical reaction, is glucose, is our main energy source. And so as we go to other nutrients of our body to, to produce energy, what we're actually doing is we're taking other molecules and making them act like glucose in this process. But we're going to utilize these glucose molecules. We store glucose, we store it as glycogen, and we can tear it apart and throw it into this system as glucose. We can make amino acids look kind of glucose-like, and we're going to describe that. We can make um, fatty acids become glucose-like in, in terms of how they act. But this is why, when we talk about diabetes and some of those conditions, why glucose is so important to us, that as we consume glucose and as we absorb glucose and our blood sugar goes up, we need to then move it into our cells, and insulin helps us as a signaling molecule for that. And once in our cells, all right, now we have the opportunity for energy. So you look at individuals, kind of describe that a little bit. You look at individuals who suffer from diabetes. And let's say you have a situation where you have a patient who, let's say you have a patient who comes in the emergency room with a blood glucose level of 18. And it's obviously extremely low. Critically low is commonly how we refer to it. Let's say you also have a patient who comes in and has a blood glucose of 1,200. Now, both of those patients are, and I, and I phrased it incorrectly, both of those patients are brought, typically brought into the emergency room. Okay? In other words, they don't walk in frequently, okay? but they're brought in, especially the one who's 18. Sometimes there are diabetics who control their glucose so poorly that they can become kind of used to or tolerant of really, really high blood sugar levels. So once in a while, a patient comes in Okay, with a blood sugar that's incredibly high that for the average person would be just horrible, life-threatening, but because they've kind of developed a tolerance to some of those high levels, um, they sometimes can come in versus when they get down to the 18, the 20s, the 30s, something like that. Yeah, they're typically brought in in that scenario. So um, kind of relating to that. Now, one of the things we want to understand is looking at those. Remember, these are blood glucose levels. So we're measuring the blood and we're measuring the amount of glucose in the blood. And both, let's, let's say both of these individuals um, have lost consciousness. Well, they've actually both lost consciousness for the same reason. You're like, well, wait a minute, that can't be true. How can they lose it for the same reason if one's 18 and one's 1,200? But this, by saying the same reason, what I mean by that is they both lack glucose. You're like, no, they don't. Look at this person. This person's 1,200. Well, they lack glucose in the place that they need glucose. And the question is, well, where is that? Well, it's in the cells. So our cells are the ones that have to produce the ATP to facilitate the chemical reactions and provide the energy source they need to function. But this person doesn't have sugar, therefore can't put it into the cells to make ATP. This person has sugar, but it can't get into the cells to produce ATP. So in both scenarios, okay, the cells are starving for glucose. They're just starving for a slightly different, well, a big different reason, but a different reason. One, because there's no glucose available, and the other, because the glucose is just in the wrong spot. So glucose becomes very important to this process of, it's the one in the chemical equation that, in the presence of oxygen, is going to produce that 36 to 38 ATP. And without it, we just can't produce enough to keep up with what we need. All right, so our next two role players, um, pyruvic acid and lactic acid. Now, very often you'll hear them referred to as pyruvate and lactate. The difference is that when they're in our body and they are in the dissolved in the solvent of our body water, they donate a proton, they donate a hydrogen ion, and so they become a lactate ion and a pyruvate ion. And so when it has the hydrogen attached, we call it lactic acid and pyruvic acid. When they donate um, that hydrogen ion or release that hydrogen ion, well, we can't call them by the same name because they're not the same molecule. And so we refer to them as pyruvate and lactate. We very commonly use them interchangeably, understanding that, all right, in 
fluids of our body, they're ionized, therefore, okay, it's lactate, but we call it lactic acid. It's not a problem to refer to them interchangeably. So by saying lactic acid, saying lactate, saying pyruvic acid, saying pyruvate, doesn't matter, it's okay. You can do that. Now, the difference is where are these involved? Okay, our lactic acid will be involved when we lack oxygen for the production of ATP. Our pyruvate, okay, our pyruvic acid, um, will be formed right before lactic acid and be formed as we have oxygen available. So you'll kind of see that come into play. But you're going to see these names um, show up here in just a minute. All right, our next one, which is very important to us, coenzyme A. Coenzyme A actually starts out as a B vitamin. Sounds kind of funny. But the A comes from the type of molecule that it actually carries. And it carries a two-carbon group called an acetyl group. And so because this vitamin that acts as a coenzyme okay, picks up that acetyl group, that's where the term comes from. So coenzyme A is actually a derivative of a B vitamin. If I'm not mistaken, it's vitamin B5 that's then kind of tweaked a little bit, but it becomes coenzyme A. The way you want to think about coenzyme A in terms of its function is it's kind of like having a coal-burning furnace. And coenzyme A is the shovel that basically, in Okay, if you want your furnace to continue to work and you want to continue to shovel coal, you don't throw the shovel in the furnace. So the advantage of this coenzyme, the advantage with a lot with our coenzymes and cofactors in our body, our vitamins, is we don't use them up in the chemical reactions. They just help with the chemical reactions. So coenzyme A acts as a shovel. And we're going to pick up these little two carbon nuggets, these acetyl group, and we're going to drop them in to our furnace. We're actually going to drop them into Krebs cycle. Okay, or citric acid cycle, or TCA cycle, however you want to refer to it, because um, we already said that those are synonyms. So coenzyme A, it's a shovel, picks up the little two-carbon nuggets, the little acetyl group, and drops them in to the process we're going to be getting into. So kind of keep that in mind as we go along. Okay, next two, okay, FAD and NAD. Okay, have big, long names. Make sure you know how to spell them for your exam. Okay, just kidding, you don't have to spell them for your exam, but make sure you know that you recognize them. Now you actually recognize them more than you think, because if you look at the names, flavin adenine dinucleotide and nicotinamide adenine um, dinucleotide, you've seen them okay, on your, or precursors to them, on your cereal box, or as you've read nutritional labels, because doesn't this look like riboflavin, and doesn't look, this look like niacin? And so these are... Um, as well, derivatives of vitamins that we consume as micronutrients in our, in our diet. One of the things we want to understand in this process is kind of going back to previous discussions where we've said, how do we store energy in chemical reactions and how do we release energy in chemical reactions? Because remember, we've written this equation like so. So here's our equation for ATP, and notice I've drawn the um, dual direction arrows in our chemical reaction here related to the fact that I can send this equation to the right and I can also send this equation to the left. And we want to understand which direction do I send it if it becomes an energy storing reaction or endergonic and where, which direction do I send it if it becomes an energy releasing reaction or an exergonic. So if I'm releasing energy, therefore it's, it's available to do other things, then I need to send it this way so that I can release energy. If I want to store energy, I want to put these three together, or put these two together with the use of that energy, and bring that equation to the left. And we've described those as being building reactions, anabolic, or tearing down reactions, catabolic. So if I'm tearing down ATP and releasing energy, that would be catabolic. If I'm putting together ADP and a phosphate, then that becomes anabolic. So anytime I'm putting together a chemical bond, so I have an anabolic reaction, I have to put energy in, or more energy in than I'm going to get out. But that's okay. Because once I put energy in, because energy cannot be created, nor destroyed, nor lost, I'm going to get energy out at some point. So it's kind of like putting money in your savings account, and it's painful at first, because you're like, man, I could spend that. Look, I could get this, and I could get this. But you're spending it, or you're saving it for a specific purpose. But then once it's released, you're going to get a lot of return on your investment, so to speak. Well, the same thing is true with our ATP. That as we store that energy, that's okay, because then we can break that bond and we can get it back. 
And well, that's exactly what we're going to be doing in the process of utilizing these two role players. And they're going to basically be picking up hydrogen ions and electrons, and they're going to be carrying it to another component of this process. They're going to be carrying it to that electron transport system at the end of this. So we're going to be forming these two and adding protons and electrons to them so that they can hold on to those, and we're going to be forming bonds, therefore we're going to be storing energy. But that's okay, because later on we're going to get that energy back out. And that's where our great big ATP yield is going to come from. Because what you're going to see is we're going to get through almost this entire process. And we got nothing. We hardly have anything. It's kind of like going to college. <laughs> you're putting in all this work and all this effort. When you get out, you get this cool piece of paper. And if you don't do anything more, you, you got nothing. Okay, but the return on that investment is huge okay, if you kind of take the next step. Well, we're going to do the same thing here. Throughout this process, you're going to hear me referring to the fact that hey, we're taking these NADs and we're getting NADHs out of them. We're taking these FADs we're getting FADH2s out of them. So we're going to be adding hydrogen ions and electrons to them. And you're like, well, what, what, what's the big deal? Well, we're, we're going to spend that money later, but we're just going to fill our pockets full of this stuff. And then when we empty our pockets, we're going to get a whole bunch that comes out of this. Okay, so that's one of the relationships we want to make. So notice here we have more equations with, okay, with double arrows where we're going to take this molecule and we're going to add hydrogen ions and electrons and form this, and we're going to take this molecule and form this. So I think the easiest way to understand what's going on here is, again, when I form chemical bonds, I'm storing energy. And so then I can get that energy back out later because energy cannot be created nor destroyed nor lost. It exists just in another form. So you're going to see these show up. So just think of them as things that I'm going to fill my pockets with so that later on, I can get that energy out. Okay. So the big player, I mean, glucose being one and or one a, and this being one and one a would be ATP. And remembering that with ATP, we store energy in these high energy bonds between the phosphate molecules. That when I add a phosphate, I store energy. When I release that phosphate, then I release energy because I'm freeing up that energy used to make that high energy bond. So very often people say, well, ATP is energy. No, ATP is not energy. But that molecule stores energy for us that, that we can then release. It's money that we can spend that has power. And that's why we very often refer to it as the energy currency of our body. So kind of keep that in mind. All right, so here's a graphic from your book that displays this, these four steps that we were referring to. Step number one being glycolysis. Step number two being formation of this acetyl coenzyme A. Taking our shovel, adding the little two carbon nugget to it, and dropping it into Krebs cycle. And then all of the, notice NADH, 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 FADH2s, all of those converging on this electron transport system or this electron transport chain. Also paying attention down here, notice where oxygen comes into play. And that's one of the important questions that I'm going to ask, okay, and I want you to think about as we go through this process. We talk about how important it is that we have oxygen available. Obviously, we don't survive without it. And so, frequently, I'll even ask some of the respiratory therapy students, because obviously, respiratory therapists, their life is all about oxygen, okay, CO2 as well, but their life is about oxygenating their patient and keeping their CO2 level at the appropriate level and keeping their oxygen level at the appropriate level. So I ask them, I said, so why is this whole, why is this oxygen stuff? Why is that so important? No, well, you need it. Why well, I know that. Why is it so important? What is its role that it plays? Where is it actually in our metabolic process? Where does oxygen come into play? Because we kind of make it as the ultimate of all molecules. But what's interesting is we go through this, you're going to see that's all oxygen does. Okay, now the whole process shuts down without it, so it is important. But when you really look at where does oxygen come into play, because we're going to be talking here for a period of time, and I'm never going to mention oxygen for the most part in terms of where it comes into play, and then all of a sudden it's like, that's it, that's all it does. Okay? But without it, of course, this process okay, ceases to work. All right, so in this process, again, oxygen is way down here, but without oxygen, we are said to revert to what we call anaerobic metabolism. And the problem is we make two net ATP per glucose molecule. 
Well, that amount of ATP with all the energy demands of our body just isn't sufficient. And so we just can't survive, especially certain organs that have a high ATP requirement. Okay, you think about as you start running out of oxygen, okay, what are your symptoms of that? What do we notice about patients? Well, all of a sudden they lose consciousness and they start to become confused and they get dizzy. And, and um, some of those types of things that we recognize, well, it's because the brain is a very ATP dependent organ because of the number of things going on there and the amount of energy required. You think about somebody who has a heart attack and they cease to deliver oxygen to their cardiac muscle cells. Well, why do they all of a sudden get pain across their chest within seconds of that happening? It's because the heart, continually beating, requires a large amount of oxygen, a large blood supply to facilitate that. So our two of our most oxygen demanding tissues are those that tell us, hey, you're running out of oxygen, and they tell us that first. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind here as we go along. All right, so first step, glycolysis. We're going to break down glucose. We're going to form pyruvic acid. Step two, formation of acetyl-CoA. We're going to take pyruvic acid, and we're going to form our two acetyl groups to attach to our coenzyme A to drop them into Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle, obviously, is going to be a sequence of chemical reactions. Okay, Actually, all of them are, but this has a cyclic type sequence. We're going to have a whole bunch of products of that and then we're going to end down here in our electron transport chain with our large amount of ATP we want and we're going to involve oxygen in this process to help us form that little bit of water. We called it metabolic water. So without oxygen we make two net ATP. With oxygen that's where we get our biggest yield, our 36 to 38 um, ATP per glucose molecule. So one of the things you want to be able to do in this process is remembering that glucose, what's its molecular formula? Pause. C6H12O6. The most important part of that is keeping track of the carbons for me. So if we have six carbons, the reason I want you to keep track of those is because as we go through this process, we're going to take those six carbons and split it into two groups of three. So now anything you do will be done twice. So we take C6, split it into two C3s. Now each of those are going to be going through the process. And we're going to take those two C3s and make them C2s, remember our little two carbon nuggets. Each of those will be going through this process. And when we get towards the end, we're going to see that I don't, I don't have any Cs left. Okay, but I haven't produced a lot of ATP yet. Okay, so I do want you to keep track of the carbons here as we go along. Okay, so step number one, and this is actually a multi-step process. Okay, but we're making this about as simple as possible. So in the process of glycolysis, you see that the, the graphic is outlined just this section. And so that's what's being represented here. That we're taking that glucose molecule, C6H12O6, and what we're going to be doing is breaking it into two C3s. And those three carbon chains being pyruvic acid. And again, it's a sequence of steps, each step requiring a separate enzyme. Um, to facilitate that process. Now, nothing comes for free. And so to be able to take that molecule having six carbons and split it into two molecules having three carbons, we got to put a little money in, but that's okay because we're going to get a re great return on our investment. Okay, let's say you go, because you're of the appropriate age, that legally you can do this or you at least look old enough that you can play until they test your ID. But let's say you go to Vegas, okay? or let's say you're doing a quick trip, you're going to Wendover, Nevada, okay? anywhere close that you can gamble a little bit. And let's say that you go and say, okay, I'm going to play, I'm going to play the craps table, or I'm going to play the roulette table. And you decide, you know what, I'm going to make a certain size bet. And the way you have your bet placed, you're having to put a bet on the table. So you're having to spend a little money. But that's okay, because every time that wheel spins, or every time the dice rolls, okay, that they're going to pay you, let's say, double your money. So you're laying down a $10 bet, and they're giving you 20 every time that the dice is rolled or every time that wheel is spun. Who wouldn't stand there all day long? Yeah, I would. Okay, Give me two, I'll give you 10. Give me three, I'll give you 20. Who wouldn't stand there all day long and just enjoy that process? It's not how it works. That's why casinos are big buildings. But you get the idea. So what happens in this process is we're going to spend a little ATP, more specifically, we're going to release a little energy so that we can get a little energy back. Now, something to pay attention to is notice the direction of the arrows. Follow them. 
So what I'm demonstrating here, what the graphic is demonstrating, is the fact that I'm putting in two ATPs, specifically the energy from two ATPs, the product of that being ADP plus P. So what I did in this scenario is we broke the ATP, we released that energy to facilitate these chemical reactions. So we spent two ATP, or the energy from two, and this was our product of that, but we released the energy to facilitate this process. Now, the advantage, though, is down as we form pyruvic acid, notice that we take four ADPs and four Ps, and we get four ATPs out. So just like the return on our investment of our roulette or our craps table event was, we put in two, get four. In two, get four. Who wouldn't do that all day long? Okay, I'm dropping two, but my return on my investment, and you'll hear business majors, okay, here at Weber State, they're on the other side of the bell tower on campus, okay, and we don't talk to each other, we're the science people, they're the business people, okay, we do talk, but, okay, you get the idea, where they talk about what we call ROI, or return on investment, I'm dropping in two, but I'm getting four. Now, in addition to that, notice that I'm taking two of my vitamins, and I am adding to them hydrogen electrons, so I'm storing energy there as well. But what I'm going to do with these, I'm going to put it in my pocket, and I'm going to save it for later, because it's not in a spendable form. So as we talk about ATP being our energy currency, it's cash. It's nobody, nobody turns down cash. Okay? They even give discounts for that. So we can immediately use the ATP we generate here, but this is going to be kind of like in our little savings account. We're going to save it till later. So I want you to kind of keep track of that. So as we break down the glucose and we form pyruvic acid, we're going to get two NADHs. We're going to get two net ATPs. Now, why did I say that? Two net. Okay, this is kind of like when you get your paycheck. This is what you actually get, but you had to spend two to get it. So that's really not what you've got. Okay, you earn. Okay, um, my son's had a job this summer it was a little bit eye-opening to him as he earned X amount of dollars but he only received X amount of dollars he goes wait a minute so there was 90 bucks there that I didn't get and it went somewhere and I said well let me explain this process to you let me humble you a little bit in terms of the amount of money you have to earn the amount of money you actually take home we had a little financial lesson well the same thing is true here we have to put in two but we're gonna get four Okay, so our net on the whole deal okay, was two. So that's where we use that term, two net ATP. So through the process of glycolysis, okay, let's describe this whole thing and summarize it. Through the process of glycolysis that occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, we have okay, one glucose, C6, that we then, by spending two ATP, we're going to get two pyruvic acids, two pyruvates, each having three carbons. And we're going to get two net ATP and two NADHs. That being energy we're going to save for later. Okay, 